Here's the anchor verse this week in Hebrews 11, 1. Now, I don't typically preach out of the message translation, but I like how readable this is, and I love the way it phrases this. Hebrews 11, 1, out of the message. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, come on, somebody say this faith, is the firm foundation. Come on, somebody say firm foundation. Under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The title of week three of Habits and Rabbits, if you're taking down notes, is Distracted Faith. Now, this is Distracted Faith part one, uh, because I had a lot of content, and uh, we were going to be here for three hours, like some of you churchy church folks. Yay! Mm -hmm. This is kind of a part one. Come back next week for part two. Okay, here we go. Distracted faith. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear you. We need it more than ever. We need a mind ready to understand. And God, we showed up willing and ready with an open heart for a deposit. God, we don't want to play church. So many people play church. We just check a box. We go through the motions. We sing songs to sing them, throw a little bit in the offering bucket and leave hoping to survive life. We need a deposit today to walk out filled up and better than when we came in. If you receive that, say amen. amen. So again, habits and rabbits that ultimately lead us down these rabbit holes and rabbit trails that can alter and even mess with our purpose and our assignment. So this weekend, I want to talk about a couple of distractions that can impact our faith. It's going to be a pretty practical word. And then again, I said it a moment ago, I believe that God is going to reignite all throughout our beautiful community in your life personally, reactivate a faith, a mustard seed faith to big audacious faith, but that we would all leave today with an extra deposit growing in faith. Because again, there are so many distractions that can impact our faith. Last week, I talked about the sobering and startling stats and statistics, which is the same thing, statistics of social media and how much we're consuming it. Now I'm on social. As somebody DM me and they're like, well, you're on social. I'm on social. But they talked about a worldwide study, Kenya being the number one, which is wild, a worldwide study that said that people are spending, on average, 146 minutes every single day on social media. It's a distraction, y'all. 888 hours a year, 36 consecutive days a year, if you're doing the math. And then we get caught in the comparison trap. The, I thought I'd be further along than this. Why are they so much better off than me? And you start getting in this comparison trap of God, have you forgotten about me? Do you not hear my prayers? Maybe it's a distraction like materialism. You're just trying to keep up with everybody. You're even buying knockoff brands. People are like, is that say Schneike? Okay, great. <laughs> Distractions of maybe you're addicted to more and you're just trying to have this consumer mentality and it's a distraction. Maybe the distraction is Climbing the corporate ladder to the point where you're stepping on everybody along the way because you've got to get yours because you're betting on you. Maybe it's relationships that you know you shouldn't be connected to. Maybe that has been distracting you and messing with your faith. Or maybe it's the current events. Maybe that's what's causing anxiety and fear, what's been happening around the world and what you're seeing with your eyes and even the political tensions. Maybe that's messing with your faith. God, where are you? I love in Matthew 13, Jesus paints this picture. Now, Jesus spoke in parables, and he would often share these almost mini stories that would help his followers and even us to this day understand the kingdom of God better. Now, some of these parables are a little bit like riddles, but if you actually get into the minutia of these parables, you'll see the depth of what Jesus was spoken. We're going to go to Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9 on the screen that same day, Jesus went out of the house. He was sitting by the Sea of Galilee, and a large crowd gathered around him. So he went and got into a boat and sat there, positioning himself as a teacher, while the crowd stood on the shore to receive. He told them many things in parables, saying, listen carefully. A sower went out to sow some seed in the field. And as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road between the fields, and these birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and at once they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. 
Verse six says, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. That's for Houston right there. That's the, not today, not this weekend, praise God. But it was scorched and because it had no roots, it withered away. Verse seven though, I love this. Other seed fell among thorns. Thorns came up and choked them out. Come on, somebody say choked them out. Now this is where it shifts in a positive perspective. Verse eight says, other seed fell on good soil. Come on, somebody say, I'm good soil. And if you're not prophesied, say, I'm about to be good soil. Come on. And yielded grain. Some hundred times as much was sown, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words. Come on, close your eyes and say, God, give me ears to hear you. I want to be good soil. Some seed fell on good soil, good ground, and yielded ground. Y'all, I grew up in a farming family where they had to go out and they would plow and cultivate and stir up the dirt in order to place seed. Here's the truth. When we grow in relationship and we're intentional every day to spend time in his presence, it plows, it cultivates, and it stirs up the hardened and callous places in our lives. But I want to echo verse 7 again for a moment in Matthew 13 here where Jesus said, some seed fell amongst thorns. It fell amongst thorns representing, this is what thorns represent. It represents the cares of the world. It fell amongst thorns. It represents distractions in this world. And those things, those things, they end up choking out the good fruit in our lives. If you've been around Hope City, you know that I love this verse, John 15, 5. It says, I'm the vine. That's God. You're the branches. Elbow the person next to you and say, you're a branch. You need trimmed back. Come on, you need trimmed a little bit. Amen. <laughs> If you remain in me, that's a choice. I feel like we can just get hung up on this and just stay here all day. If you remain in me. Ooh, that's where humanity gets in the way. So the source of all good things is the vine. We're the branches. So we get to receive if you remain in me. Only if you do it. Only if you don't get distracted. Sidetracked. Distracted by the things in life that keep you, keep you maybe in a mindset that says, well, I'm better on my own. And then you end up trying to make yourself the vine. I'm the vine. You're the branches. He says, if you remain in me and I and you, you will bear a little bit of fruit, much fruit. And this line right here is very, very sobering. But apart from me, you can do nothing. We allow these distractions to become thorns in our lives. And what happens is the good seed that God is wanting to release over our lives to bear much fruit gets choked out. And when that fruit gets choked out, what ends up happening is you end up leading and living on E. You ever been in, in the car with that person and you're like, Whoa. and it looks like you need a little bit of gas. And they're like, oh, I know this car. This car can run on fumes for two hours. And dear Lord. No, but in life, when you run on E and you run on your own strength, you end up depleted. You end up feeling empty. I've shared this story in the past, but if you're new to Hope City, I've got the mic, so I'm going to share it again. Amen. I remember <laughs> Pastor Jackie's dad lived next to, um, I might write a whole book out of this, to be honest. I love this, this moment that the Holy Spirit met me with, by the way, the Holy Spirit is always speaking. I say that often. Uh, just because I'm clergy and I can marry people and bury people doesn't mean I have more access to the Holy Spirit than you. Look at the person next to you and say, you have access to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He's always speaking and he'll speak to you in daily living. So next door to my wife's dad's house was the nicest garden I'd ever seen in my life. Like hands down, the nicest garden. I remember walking out and I was drawn like a moth to a flame to it. I was like, this is the nicest garden. And I'm, I'm looking at the rows are perfect. Everything is blooming. Everything is healthy. And I'm like, that's a good garden. <laughs> Her dad's like, all right, it's creeping me out. Come inside the house. I'm like, this, sir, this garden's amazing. And this guy walks out kind of aggressive. He's like a country clacker door. He's like, clack, clack. And he comes out of the house. He's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm good. He's like, don't touch anything. I'm like, I'm not touching. It's just a pepper. <laughs> One tomato. <laughs> I'm just. And I said, is this your garden? He's like, yeah, who's asking? I said, man, it, let me just say this. If I was a photographer for Garden Monthly Magazine, I would be 
taking pictures. He's like, are you? I was like, I don't even know if that exists. I don't, but if I was, I'd, I'd be out here just taking pics. And I said, man, this is phenomenal. And I said, man, what's your secret? Because next door was hands down the worst garden I'd ever seen. Like I was trying to convince the guy with the good garden for us to just burn it down. Like it was bad. Not really. <laughs> no, it was a really bad garden. And I was like, like these are the polar opposite. This one is vibrant and growing, full of life. This one, you have to dig through the weeds and the mess to even find anything that's remotely alive. And I said, man, what's your, what's your secret? He was a little puffed up after the whole Garden Monthly magazine sort of. He was a little puffed up. He was like, oh my, I'll wait every day. And I said, what? And he's like, I'll wait every day. And I said, you do. You do. What? And he goes, I'll wait every day. I said, you win. You win every day. And he's like, I'll wait every day. I said, you are a winner. You're winning every day. Say it a little bit more. He's like, I'll win every day. I said, you do. You're a, you've won the garden of the year. You're the winner. You are. And he smiled. And he goes, man, no, I... I weed every day. He's a little country, so we weed every day. He said, I weed every day. He said, I weed every day. And I said, you have to pull weeds every day? That's pretty high maintenance. Where's all the gardeners at? Come on, where's all the... Man, bless you. Amen. Two people. Say, like, woo! <laughs> she was wearing her glove, too. Garden glove. She's like... Amazing. I want to talk to you about it. He said, I weed every day. He said, you have to pull weeds every day. And this is what he said. And this is what the Holy Spirit nudged my heart. He said, I don't have to pull weeds every day. Watch this. But I check for weeds every day. Somebody needs to write that down. I need to start checking for weeds every day. That could be the weed of discontentment. That could be the weed of pride. That Now, some of you are like, is he talking about weed? Not weed. Not weed, weed. Don't check for your weed. Throw your weed out. This is ridiculous. We're off the rails. This is one of the early services. It's going to be wild the rest of the day. No, but there's weeds. Because you know what a weed's job is? And I asked him, I said, why do you have to check every day? He said, because weeds strangle. Weeds choke out. Weeds will ruin all the good growth. Ooh, that's a whole word. That wrong relationship is a weed. That toxic thinking, that's a weed. That, that generational struggle that you haven't been able to just let go, that's a weed. And the job of a weed, and sometimes, this is the thing about a weed, the weeds will grow up and look and disguise and counterfeit. My kids will gather little sunflowers, not sunflowers, what are the dandelions all the time for Jackie, and try to hand it to them, and they're like, Mom, flowers. And I want to be like, kids, those are weeds. Those are weeds. Disguised as something beautiful. Ooh. It will choke out the good fruit in your life. And he said, that's his problem next door. Good guy refuses to check for weeds and refuses to weed. And because of that, he's out here navigating through all the rotten things, all the broken things, all the things eaten by animals and all the bugs. And he tries to find what's left. I need somebody to grab this distracted faith has an impact, a significant impact on our lives. It goes beyond you. It goes beyond you because it goes to your family and even your future. And the truth is we have to daily check for things in our lives that are trying to choke out the good fruit. Check for things in our lives that's distracting our faith and trying to mess with our joy because it messes with your strength. Messes with your hope. Messes with your peace. I said this at the beginning of last year, and I've continued to live it out. My peace is non-negotiable. Like, whatever is trying to rob you of your peace is too expensive. Look at the person next to you and say, don't be too expensive. Amen. Now, I'm a pretty meticulous guy. You can probably tell by the shape of my beard. I'm a pretty meticulous guy. And I was walking out to my Jeep the other day. Now, this is a full dad transparent moment. I walk out to my Jeep and one of our kids, now when they do these type of things, one of Jackie's kids, uh, spit, <laughs> spit gum out on, our, on our, uh, our driveway. Her kid's my driveway. I saw it and I was like, my goodness, what is that? And it was, it's ridiculous. And I was like, this gum. So I interrogate interrogate and investigate by talking to each kid separately. And I said, did you spit gum out on my driveway? What? 
One of my kids was like, how do you spell that? Gump? Can you put it in a sentence? I'm like, that's enough. My littlest one was like, maybe it was a, a bird or a squirrel, and maybe it fell out of their beak. I'm like, I respect the diversion. I do. I respect the diversion, and I couldn't get anybody to admit it. So I went inside, and we have a bottle of Super Duper Orange Organic Cleaner where the guy knocked on the door and told us, like, you can clean your driveway with it. And wipe off appliances. You can even drink it, sir. It's that organic, but it'll get rid of gum and goo. I'm like, I know gum, but ugh, goo? Nobody knows what that is. I don't want to even know what goo is. But I realized we had it, and I didn't read the, I didn't read the directions. I have a point. Some of y'all are like, tie this into a message. Hold on. I didn't read the directions, and it's a concentrated super orange cleaner, and I ended up over-diluting it. I put way too much water in it, and it didn't have any strength. And I ended up spraying it, spraying it. It took me way longer than it should have, way more elbow grease than it needed to, because I watered it down too much. And here's the truth. When we deal with habits and rabbits, patterns that can distract us from our destiny, Distractions in life can ultimately water down and dilute our focus, our faith, and our commitment to God. Well, what happens when you live a watered down, diluted life? Well, here's some of the unfortunate consequences. You live a shallow spiritual life with surface level engagement, surface level engagement that replaces deep, meaningful, spiritual cultivation in the presence of God. You also live a, with a weekend prayer life. And some of you are like, did he just say pray on the weekends? No, a weekend, like a week prayer life. Like, boy, you got me weak. Like weak. Like a weak prayer life. The consequences to living a watered down, distracted foundation of faith is a weak word life. You're no longer hungry for the things of God. You check a box to come on a weekend. You show up like the average consumer in Christianity in America which a full-time churchgoer comes once a month to every six weeks. Only 20% of our core church comes every single week. Make some noise, 20%. Come on. See how quiet it was? Because the other 80% of you are like, I'm in the six weeks. Amen. No, but when you live a watered-down life and you're not in the Word, you know what ends up happening? Here's some other unfortunate consequences. You don't live with peace. You have a loss of, of hope. You just kind of get through life and hope that tomorrow is better. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 12, that hope deferred actually makes the heart sick. You end up losing hope. I mentioned last week in one of the services about Peter, the only other documented man in the Bible who walked on water other than Jesus. I mean, what a phenomenal big faith story. As a little kid, I tried to walk on the water and kept sinking. I was like, Mom, why not? She's like, because I didn't name you Peter. I'm like, what? She was just trying to not have to explain it. No, but Peter, when he was focused on the source, when he was focused on the vine, not the distractions all around him, that brother got out of the boat and walked on a firm foundation that he should have been sinking on because his position shifts and his perspective changes, he loses his focus away from his faith. This is what it says in Matthew 14, verse 29 through 31. He said, come, this is Jesus's words to Peter because he was full of faith. He got out of the boat and this brother walked on the water coming towards Jesus. I mean, just like, hey, Jesus, this is crazy. Look at this. We're out here. Like, we out here. Like, this is wild, right? But watch this. Verse 30. But when he saw, this is where it shifts, the effects of the wind. When he was frightened by what was happening with inflation in the economy. When he was distracted by the diagnosis. Or when he looked at his checking account and said, I must have been hacked. There's no way. Mm-mm. There's no way. <laughs> That's my ledger. <laughs> when he saw the wind, he was frightened. And what happened? He began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And I love this. I love this in verse 31. Go to the next. Read that first word. What's it say? 
immediately. Somebody say suddenly. suddenly. I think sometimes our thought process of who God is is this angry, rage-filled, because maybe that's the only father figure you ever knew, was an angry dad, a militant father. Jesus could have said, Peter, <laughs> wade in the water for a little bit. You're going to need to doggy paddle. You ever doggy paddle, Peter? This is a good opportunity. He's like, <laughs> no, it says immediately. This is the mercy that we can experience through relationship with Jesus. Immediately, Jesus extended his hand and caught him saying, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Peter lost his focus. He got distracted and ultimately it led him to stop believing the answer the vine, the source to all of it was right there. And we in our humanity, if you've heard nothing else today, we have the faith and the ability to walk out into the unknown when we fix our eyes on Jesus. But the problem is we easily get distracted. Distractions of faith. So I'm going to give you some practical strategies to maintain our focus, some spiritual disciplines to help us maintain and even realign and restore our focus to our faith. And I've discovered that sometimes it's not that I need, we talk about like, I just need my moment to change. Sometimes it's not about a moment that needs to change. You just need to change what you're looking at. You need to keep your attention and your eyes on Jesus, not your situation, not the bills that are due, which I know are very real, but when you keep your eyes on the source of hope, the source of it all, you'll begin to have peace in the midst of the uncertainty. People will start wondering, why, why are you such a forever optimist? Because he and I have history. And he's fought for me before, and he didn't bring me this far just to have brought me this far. So I'm going to choose to keep my eyes on him again and again and again. That's why it's so important to be in the Word of God every day. Here's some practical steps. I do this probably every six weeks. I ask this question. If you're new to Hope City, I'm about to give you a pearl here. How many of y'all do the first? You apply the first 20 every day. Okay, that's better than the last time I asked. The first 20 is this, for those of you who are new. These are some practical ways to keep your eyes on Jesus because this is intentional and practical steps. Number one, first 20, first five minutes, first 20 every day, first five minutes you get in the Word every day. version has so many devotionals and, and things that you can walk out every day. First five minutes in the Word, next five minutes in worship, the third five minutes in prayer, and then the fourth five minutes to wrap up the 20 is to simply remember. I've said this for a long time that I don't feel like we have so much of a faith problem. We have a remembering problem because we're so consumed by what's in front of us. And God's like, you do know that I healed you back here, right? You, you, you do know I provided for you over here. And if I did that then, then I can do it again. So the first 20 challenge every single day. And then what ends up happening is you get hungry. And you're going to want 25 and then 30. And you're going to say 40. I talk to people all the time in the lobby. They're like, 20 minutes, please. Boy, please. Don't play. Quit playing. Like I get up for an hour earlier and I spend time in the presence of God. Five, five, five. Word, worship, prayer. Remember. Here's Here's a couple other things to keep your eyes on Jesus. Two times a year, two times a year, January and coming up here in August, we take 21 days as a church community and family and we pray and we fast. We're intentional about praying. We gather every Saturday morning and pray. I'm I'm just letting you know ahead of time, coming up to August. We pray and we fast. We pray, we're intentional about our focus on Jesus through prayer, and then fasting is letting our flesh know, you're not in charge anymore. My eyes are fixed on Jesus, and it is like a reset. It's like a hard restart. The beautiful thing about this is, you can do that anytime. Pastor Jackie and I, Anytime we're about to make a major decision, we take three days to pray and fast. We pray every day, but we fast for those three days. We fast separately, and then we come together and we compare notes. The Holy Spirit, listen, gentlemen, the Holy Spirit always reveals it to her before me. I don't know. (laughs) She's like, boy, I got that in the first three hours. It took you three days? I'm like, my God. Fast and pray. Another way that I love to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus is meditation on the scripture. Now, meditation, we get real weirded out about it because it sounds very new agey, like, and we're not talking about that. 
We're talking about diving in and getting into the verses. And you don't have to just rush through the pages. When you spend time meditating on the word, the Holy Spirit will put a magnifying glass over the scriptures and he'll speak to you through his word. So I like to get into a scripture and just land there. Don't, don't, don't read it for like 20 minutes and be like, I didn't read that much. No, what did the Holy Spirit tell you in that moment? And then he'll dissect it. Here's an example of what I love to do. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26. Bible theologians believe is the greatest blessing in the Bible. It's the benediction. We speak it as a prophecy over you. I will do it at the end of today's service. At the end of every one of our Hope City services, we speak it out. So I'll live in that verse. This is one way that I keep my eyes on Jesus and not distracted by the cares of the world, the thorns of the world. I, this is the way I keep my eyes on Jesus right here. So Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26, walking through it. May the Lord bless you. So I'll pause and say, God, thank you. Thank you for providing. Thank you that everything I put my hand to, Deuteronomy 28.8, will prosper. May you keep me. God, I thank you today for protection upon my amazing family. I pray, God, today there will be no accidents and cause no accidents. I pray, God, today that no thief, robber, burglar, murder. Like, I go through all this. All in this one verse. May he bless me and keep me. Make his face to shine upon me. God, out of all the billions of people in the world, that in days that feel heavy and overwhelming, I pray, God, that you would light up my path, that you would be gracious to me, as the verse goes on and says. You know the word gracious literally means favor, that you would grant me favor today, that I would have favor with both God and man today. So by praying this prayer and meditating on this verse, I'm keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm walking, not distracted by the wind and the waves. And then it says, uh, turn your countenance towards me. I love that. Out of, again, all the billions of people in the earth. Hey, Jesus, I need you. He hears you. He turns his focus and his attention on you because he loves you that much. Come on, say that loud. He loves me that much. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm God's favorite. Come on. Look at your second choice and say, no, I really am. Okay. <laughs> and then the last part of this verse that I love, it says, and may he give you peace. The Holy Spirit is the only one in the midst of everything going on. Wars, rumors of wars, political tensions, economy, gas prices, all the stuff. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can overshadow you with peace in the midst of the chaos. Come on, one more time. Just give him praise for that. So I meditate on the scripture. Another way to strengthen our spiritual foundation, I say it almost every week, and I'm going to say it again because repetition is key. Get in a group. Don't do life alone. We are better together. The enemy will try to get you to isolate yourself and make you feel like, I don't need a group. A group needs me. No, we all need community. Community is crucial in maintaining a focused and active foundation of faith. Another way to strengthen your spiritual foundation, make some noise, dream team. Come on, make some noise if you serve. It's to jump on the dream team. We do these dream team Super days on Sunday. Well, I don't know what they're called. They're not super days. Super Sunday dream team days. It's like a monster truck rally. Super, super dream team. I don't know what that is. That's ridiculous. We do these dream team days because we believe that purpose comes alive when you get off the sidelines and jump in with your yes. Yes, I will allow you to unlock my gifting and my strengths. We have HC Connect following every service today. If you want more information about how to unlock that purpose and jump on the dream team and honestly become part of that family, you can jump in and be a part. I love what Pastor Aubrey said at our midweek chapel last week. He said, if you're too big of a deal to serve, then you're too small to lead. So how you serve and how you jump on the team is go through HC Connect. Another practical way to stay focused on Jesus is to set up some realistic spiritual goals and priorities. I said it a moment ago, the YouVersion Bible app has so many devotionals. You can buy the one-year Bible. You can do it. Come on, say it loud. I can do it. Like, you can do it. From Genesis to Revelation, you can read through the Bible in a year. Two more practical ways, Bible studies. Gentlemen, 7 a.m. Join me at 7 a.m. on Tuesdays. HopeCity.com slash Bible studies. I got two dudes. They're like, yeah, let's do it. The other guys were like, nah, do you stream it online? Okay, 7 a.m. 
we gather. And then ladies, the W Collective Women's Bible Study. My beautiful wife, Jackie, will be leading it this Tuesday at 11 a.m. Come join us. And gentlemen, let me just say this. It's not a competition, but maybe it is. Uh, the ladies are doubling attendance compared to the dudes. And some of you guys are like, yeah, because it's so early. Come on, get up, make a cup of coffee, and show up. Listen, we show up because we're making room for you to show up, and your family's counting on you. Come on. Speaking of families, moms, dads, show up. Show up more than just once a month on the weekends. Show up more than just a every once in a while worship experience, because the truth is, show your kids that faith and community is essential to not only your growth in relationship with Jesus, but there as well. Pastor Jackie and I are all-in leaders, which is why we have all kinds of opportunities for you to grow and be discipled so you, you can keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Like We're 100% all-in, and we're believing for a church that's going to do everything they do and give 100%. So everything we do, whatever you do, give 100%, unless you're donating blood, and then that's too much, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it all. Amen. <laughs> all right, refocusing. Faith is obedience. You may want to write this down. Faith is obedience until you understand, not when you understand. Faith is obedience until you understand, not when you understand. Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Pluck out the weeds in life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 talks about how we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And when you are keeping your eyes on Jesus spiritually and you're keeping your eyes on the word, the faith of the word and the watering of the word and the meat of the word begins to grow in your life. That's why it's so important to hide the word in your heart, to keep it hidden in your heart. I don't know how many times, conservatively a thousand, let's say, I don't know how many times in my life that in real time I needed hope on demand, or I needed a, the, a scripture, or I need the spirit of God to speak and bubbling up out of my spirit because what fills spills is what came out. So when I was praying for somebody or I encountered somebody that was broken, or maybe they lost their focus on Jesus, I could say, well, let me tell you, the Bible says, and some of y'all are like, that's wild. I don't even think I could do that. You don't have to do it. It's the spirit of God in you. Paul said, it's not with my enticing words or perfect oratory delivery. It's the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit in me. So come on, all we have to do is make room. Come on, somebody say, I'm going to make room. We have to keep the word hidden in our heart. We have to step out of the boat, recognizing that we literally have built-in supernatural GPS where God will shine a light. He'll shine a light on our path, and we don't have to walk by emotions or by feelings because that will blow us all over the place. We have to walk by faith. Because here's the truth. Anyone can believe God is good when things are going well. Like, how are you? I'm too blessed to be stressed, brother. (laughs) If I was doing any better, I couldn't stand myself. (laughs) If I was doing any better, I'd have to be two of me. (laughs) If I was doing any better, God should have made me a twin. I need a bunch. All right. It's all like dad sayings. (laughs) Now, anybody can believe God is good when things are going well but it takes faith to believe in his goodness and his faithfulness and his promises when life seems to be shattering around you and falling apart. David said this in Psalms 119, 107, everything's falling apart on me, God. So put me back together again with your word. What we know is his promises. And what we know, and I've been preaching this for a long time, we know that his promises don't have expiration dates on them. We know that his promises don't break when we when we lean on them, when we've leaned on others, relationships fall apart. We can't be codependent on people. We have to lean on the promises of God, knowing their yes and amen. And here's a promise that I believe is going to help you today. Isaiah 41 10 says, do not fear. Why? Why? Because I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. Why? Because I'm your God. And then this is the promise. And I will strengthen you and I will help you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I've got great news for you today. As we pluck out weeds and we remove the distractions of faith, I've got great news for you. God can flip the script. He can turn it around. He can release blessings and favor over your life. He can remix it. He can approve it, do it. 
He can grant it and remove it. He can increase it all in one moment. Our part is to stay focused, stay on mission, stay strong, and walk by faith. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to repeat this after me. And we're going to jump back in. I asked Hope City Worship to come back. I really wanted our ending today to be built on a worship foundation, which is ultimately the rock of our salvation, Jesus. And I believe there's a reigniting of faith that's about to happen in each and every one of our lives as we realign our focus and our attention like Peter when he stepped out of the boats. And then we're also going to do a little bit of a self-examination in our spirit, in our emotions, in our mental state and say, God, is there anything, any seed that's fallen amongst the thorns that's trying to choke out the good fruit in my life? And then we're going to release that to God in this moment of worship. But before we do, I want you to say this out loud. I want you to prophesy this. Job 22, 28 says that when we decree a thing, we speak a thing, it shall be established. Proverbs 18, 21 says that death and life's in the power of your tongue. So I want you to speak this over your life. Say this out loud. This anxiety isn't mine. This loneliness isn't mine. This barely surviving and barely making it, it isn't mine. This brokenness, no, it's not mine. This fear, this turmoil, all this concern, it isn't mine. What's mine? Right here, this is, the, this is the realigning right here. This is the refocusing. What's mine, say, is the peace of God. Woo. What's mine is knowing that I have a father and a friend in Jesus. What's mine is knowing that I might not have enough, but my God is the vine, and he is the source, and he will resource everything he started in me, and he is faithful to complete the work in my life. Come on, if you receive that, give him praise. That's what's mine. That's what's mine. Would you stand to your feet? You are my firm foundation. I've never been more glad. I've never I love this right here. More glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I would come on with one Yeah.
never will. He won't. I can depend on you, Lord. You won't fail. close just for a moment if you have gotten off track maybe you've been distracted and your faith has been watered down it's been diluted maybe you'd say pastor you know, I used to have so much faith I used to believe with big faith for miracles I used to believe for breakthrough I used to but I, I've become a realist <laughs> I've really just kind of went the path of what maybe seems the most dependable. And the truth is, I need a reigniting of my faith today. If there's anything choking out your faith today, would you just release it? Come on, would you just open-handedly let it go and say, God, right now I let go of that. I let go of those distractions. I don't want just a surface level relationship with you. I want a deep deep cultivated relationship with you. I don't want to just be a surface Christian. I want to be on fire for you. I want to grow every day in you. I want to have big audacious faith. I want to believe for miracles to see people get up out of wheelchairs. I want to have great faith that sees breakthrough and deliverance and restoration and marriages and family. Will you just, will you just release that right now and allow the Holy Spirit to just pour more of Him in your life and less of you? Because He won't fail. That God today reignite our faith. In this part one of distractions of faith, God, next week I'm going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about how to continue to grow in our faith. But for today, maybe you're here. Two invitations, two opportunities. You would say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. I want to know him. Maybe somebody invited you to Hope City and you showed up. Which, by the way, I'm proud of you for even showing up. Maybe you tuned in online. Maybe somebody sent you a link or you just stumbled upon it on Facebook or YouTube. It's not by chance or accident that you're tuning in right now. But you would say, Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. The Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. He'll write victory in your story. There are your sins as far from the east as the west. Everything is about to change. Or maybe you're the second invitation opportunity today and you would say pastor daniel the truth is i knew jesus i've walked with jesus but like peter i begin to sink because i was distracted by the winds and the waves but today i want to realign my focus my attention and my heart to his one i want to give my life to jesus when i hit three if you're either one of those invitations i want you to boldly lift up your hand two i want to rededicate my life three if that's you would you wave at me I'm looking all over the room. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Amazing. I see you. Incredible. Let's all pray this prayer and then we're going to get out of here. Say this out loud. Jesus, here's all my sin. Here's all my shame. Here's all my brokenness. Here's all my issues. Here's all my distractions. I repent. I'm asking for your forgiveness. Thank you for hanging on that cross, swapping your life out for mine so that I can live a life filled with freedom, a life filled with hope. From this moment on, I'm going to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, that's a really great opportunity to shout right there.